Welcome friends, welcome to this CND webinar entitled, What Would a Nuclear War Be Like? The world is closer to nuclear war than ever before. In January, the hands of the doomsday clock were set at 100 seconds to midnight, and that was before Russia's illegal and brutal invasion of Ukraine. On a daily basis, we hear of the increasing possibility of nuclear war. Putin has placed Russian nuclear weapons on special alert and issued thinly veiled threats about their use. Others urge the setting up of a no-fly zone, which would accelerate a war between NATO and Russia, which could easily go nuclear. As one of our friends in the peace movement in Ukraine wrote to us at the weekend, we believe this brutal invasion should be stopped, but we strongly oppose reckless demands to close the sky. Many politicians speak of nuclear use in a cavalier fashion, and many people don't understand the full horror of what nuclear use would be like. So, to help us understand what such a terrible catastrophe would be like, we're very pleased this evening to welcome a panel of experts to share their knowledge and expertise. And it's our sincere hope that as well as informing ourselves this evening, you'll really take the opportunity to share the information that comes over to us tonight. And then in that way, we'll be able to contribute to the education of the population against nuclear war. So we're going to hear from our three speakers for 10 minutes each. And then after that, we'll have a Q&A session. So please do put your questions and comments in the Q&A box as you go along. We're going to hear, first of all, from Dr. Rebecca Johnson. She's going to speak about the immediate impact of the bomb. Then we're very fortunate to hear from Dr. Michael Orgel from MEDACT who will cover in particular the health implications. And then finally, we'll turn to Dr. Stuart Parkinson from Scientists for Global Responsibility to talk about the impact of nuclear war on the climate and other medium to long-term effects. So uh, Rebecca, big welcome over to you to start off our evening. Thank you very much, Kate. Can I just check that you can see my screen share? Yep. So, well, these are very, very difficult, terrible times. The humanitarian catastrophe that is engulfing Ukraine is shocking and it's heartbreaking. And it is one in a long line of wars that we have been seeing happen in these last 70 years that nuclear weapons have been around supposedly to deter. And things appear set to get much worse with the risk of escalating into nuclear war, being put on the horizon by nuclear threats from Vladimir Putin. This is Putin's war, it is not the war of the Russian people. And I want to pay tribute to all of the ordinary citizens, so very not ordinary, the people, the civil society of both Russia and Ukraine who are resisting this war in the best ways they know how. Uh, and in the case of the Russian protesters being arrested 
in the case of the Ukrainians being dispossessed and, and forced to flee or lock down as their hospitals are being um, bombed. So, oh, this, yeah. So <clears throat> this is the context that I want to be looking at because three days after invading Ukraine, Putin put Russia's nuclear forces on what he was translated as special alert. But uh, this, uh, and then, you know, all the, um, you know, all the um, pundits started talking about tactical nuclear weapons and are they going to be used? So there are a few things that I need to say before we go into the impacts. First of all, 900 of Russia's uh, 5,900 or so nuclear weapons that they have are already on prompt launch alert, which is what we would call high alert. And that is very similar to the situation with NATO. About 900 of US nuclear weapons are um, on high alert um, amongst the US, UK and, and UK nuclear weapons. So, uh, so don't be fooled by this idea of tactical nuclear weapons being something small. It means short range. Theater means medium range, like the crews and the SS-20s that we got rid of in the 1980s from Greenham Common and the rest of Europe. These weapons that they're talking about, they're usually bigger than the Hiroshima bomb. All nuclear weapons are strategic and all can be fired by intent, accident or mistake. And that other part of the slide is from one of the um, humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons conferences when Dr. Patricia Lewis from Chatham House was giving information on how many times, 13 times since the Cuban Missile Crisis have we actually faced uh, the, the, the risk of nuclear weapons by miscalculation, mistake, or, or uh, some other reason. This is Hiroshima and the famous bomb dome. The only reason why that survived was because it was the strongest possible uh, concrete compared to the, the, the normal buildings um, of Hiroshima. And the little boy uranium bomb was about 12 and a half kilotons compared to the UK's uh, Trident uh, weapons, which is about a hundred kilotons. And three days later, in fact, on the day when uh, Nagasaki was bombed, this photograph was taken of what was known as a relief station in, in Hiroshima. And, um, and it's just heartbreaking because the, you see these kinds of things all the time in wars. And here we are also getting a blurring of the distinctions when so-called conventional wars ex uh, you, you know, have uh, explosive weapons uh, exploding on hospitals in city centers, the size and the explanation, the explosions, the thermal barrack, these are obscene, inhumane weapons. Um, Rebecca, Rebecca, yeah. I'm just going to stop you there because um, people aren't seeing your slides. Oh, I'm right. just, I'm just seeing the one which says when nuclear deterrence fails. But I think a lot of people um, aren't seeing anything. So. Um, mm. Someone seeing. It seems to, okay. It seems to have. It seems okay. Can you see that now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Let me just quickly go back. Then I think I've got given you the information. Yes. Here just are some of the visuals yeah. of this, and I'll make this available to CND to put on the website. Thanks. So, um, so this is is these are actually Russian uh, missiles going through um, uh, Moscow and. Um, and this data from Chatham House about the near, nuclear near misses. And this was a picture I really wanted you okay. to, just to remind you of Hiroshima. So do interrupt and tell me if you can't see the next. I think this, it's, it's working now fine. Thanks. So this is the relief station and it, it's tragic. You know, th this was real life for civilians in Hiroshima in 1945. 
And we have General Lee Butler, who was actually the commander of US nuclear forces in Europe at the time of the Cold War ending. He was, was and he basically, he, he really tried to tell people and show people nuclear, de nuclear deterrence is not a property of any kind of weapon. It's not a property of a nuclear weapon. It's not a magic bullet. It's not a, a you know, a, a voodoo thing. It's a dialogue. It's a, a relationship. It's a conversation. And as we all know in our lives, conversations and dialogues can go wrong, can be misunderstood. And what he said was, it's usually, and he should know, a dialogue between the blind and the deaf. So all kinds of deterrents often fail. Nuclear weapons are not a sensible thing to have around at all when you have got any kind of military conf confrontations. They are not a good tool, if you like, for deterrence whatsoever. But Putin thinks now that he's got a deterrent against everyone else who might be wanting to come to, to the aid of Ukraine. Here are some numbers. This was Nagasaki. And look at these numbers, the deaths, the injuries. These are immediate deaths and injuries. They were pretty much, I mean, they were far greater by the end of, of 1945. So what are those short term, the immediate effects of nuclear explosions? These were the facts and the, the, uh, the arguments that were used to get the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which persuaded the governments why we had to ban and eliminate them. The blast is the initial absolutely direct, the blast and the heat and flash really come together. The heat and, 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 and flash burns. You remember seeing the shadows left from the, the people who were outdoors in, in uh, Hiroshima and the fires and the massive firestorm. The blast runs right, it's a huge wind. It knocks down the, the, the building, the houses, and they fall in on each other. They fall in on, on uh, the people inside them. Uh, the firestorms then ignite those and people die inside those houses that can't get out. And then there is the radiation and that leads to the, the, the and it comes down, it comes immediately, but it also comes down as fallout, especially often the black rain. Uh, these I, I know Michael is going to go far more into. Nowadays, we would also get the electromagnetic pulse, a massive, complete, communications breakdown, like the most massive cyber attack you could ever imagine. And remember the environmental effects on all living things, and then on climate and agriculture. And again, I'm not going to go into detail about that because I know Stuart is going to talk about nuclear winter and, and, and the destruction that that will cause. But to say that just from those relatively small bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, survivors over the years envied the dead. In, in this picture, um, the two little children, they didn't have their heads shaved, that was their hair falling out. This was taken within months of the Hiroshima bomb, or Hiroshima or Nagasaki bomb, and they, they died of, of the radiation sickness because they'd been so close to the center. Um, and, and here also you see children starving because that is one of the effects that I hope that Stuart is going to talk about. So in closing, I want to say deterrence often fails. Nuclear weapons don't deter. It didn't deter Putin's invasion. It didn't deter the, the you know, the, the, the Afghan, the um, wars on Afghanistan and Iraq or the Falklands. Um, Nuclear weapons did not get directly involved in those. They are directly involved he here because there are 11,000 nuclear weapons surrounding Ukraine through Russia and the three nuclear armed states in NATO. And when nuclear deterrence fails, what are the choices? And I hope to come back to that in, in the Q&A. Refraining from firing the British Trident would obviously be the most appropriate and humane decision. But that just points to the suicidal dangers of equipping the UK with nuclear weapons that are viewed as a threat 
by other countries that are nuclear armed. Mm -hmm. So I will leave it there and do a plug for my report and that you can get on the CND website or Nuclear Ban uh, Scott uh, and so on. Uh, but that's where I'm going to leave my talk. Thanks very much indeed, Rebecca. And that was very, very uh, powerful and, and very disturbing, I think, even for people who have heard and seen much of what happened in Japan. It, it's still always a real wake up call that we need to take action. Um, next, I'm going to call Dr. Michael Orgel from MEDACT. Michael, over to you. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Michael Lorgol, uh, a medical doctor from MedAct Scotland based in Edinburgh. MedAct is the UK affiliate of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. And we're also an affiliate of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Firstly, I want to express solidarity with the peace campaigners and Ukraine and Russia, and acknowledge the horrendous suffering and needless deaths in the war. Some of the following is very graphic and extremely upsetting, but I believe the information is so important that it needs to be brought to the forefront of our minds. Physicians, nurses, health professionals have a special obligation to address the threat of nuclear weapons. and to uh, address the uh, threat that is currently happening. Why? Because we're seen by the public as the guardians of public health and have a special credibility. We've been told many times that climate change is the gravest threat we face. However, we don't need a competi competition. There's two grave intersectional threats and we need to multitask and work together to overcome both threats now more than ever. What happens in a nuclear detonation in a nuclear detonation, uh, the uh, bomb's uranium and plutonium atoms split, that's called fission, instantly creating a highly radioactive flash and an intensely hot fireball with temperatures as hot as the sun. Anything within range of that will be vaporized, including skin. People further away may escape the fireball, but receive about a thousand times more ionizing radiation uh, from the flash than they would in a year's natural background exposure, dying within days from acute radiation poisoning. The fireball sucks in surrounding air, which rises to form the classic mushroom cloud. Fireballs touching the ground take up solid particles, which absorb fission products, and the fallout downwind uh, makes large areas of the ground fatally radio radioactive for several hours. Carcinogenic levels of radioactivity linger for years. Airburst explosions produce less fallout, but fission products get dispersed globally around the upper atmosphere. And uh, uh, very high altitude detonations release the powerful pulse of photons, um, also known as the electric ma uh, ma magnetic pulse, which can damage electronic devices across borders, severely disrupting communications, making uh, ambulance callouts and first aid impossible. The immediate post-attack period burns would constitute the most common and serious medical problem. Hundreds of thousands of people would have sustained major second and third degree burns. These people would need urgent and intensive medical therapy it would not be available. In the entire United States, if there were to be a larger war, patients across North America, at best, a tiny fraction of the hundred of thousands of burn patients would receive appropriate medical care. The rest would die. And these shocking scenarios are the same for London, which has only two specialist burn beds. In addition to these burn patients, there would be many thousands 
of other injuries. People blinded by the, fat, the flash, deafened when the pressure wave comes, people with lungs collapsed by the tremendous pressures, people with stab wounds from flying debris, people with bones broken when they had been hurled through the air by the hurricane force winds or trapped under collapsing buildings. People who survive the immediate blast damage may ne nevertheless be severely injured and lack access to even basic first aid help. If they survive in the short term, the horrors of starvation and poor shelter and sanitation may well be insurmountable. No hospital help would be available in the absence of functioning hospitals and health personnel. People surviving in the short term, but exposed to very high amounts of radiation die within weeks of brain damage, radiation burns, impaired healing and bone marrow and gastrointestinal failure. For exposed uninjured survivors in the midterm time frame in areas more remote from ground zero who managed to get help in the absence of anything but the most basic services, any effective healthcare will be severely limited for months and dependent on food, water, and sanitation. The outlook would be grim. Half the people with no open injury but exposed to high amounts of radiation would die of acute radiation poisoning within three months. Long-term effects from a nuclear bomb's radiation are manifold. Women exposed to the detonation during pregnancy have a higher risk of miscarriages and fetal abnormalities. For women who become pregnant after exposure to the detonation, there haven't been many studies possible, but over the years, it's clear from other studies that women exposed to nuclear ionizing radiation are at higher risk of acquiring cancers and leukemias. Lowish amounts of ionizing radiation affect women and children more than men, but over ensuing years, people of any gender are at high risk of acquiring cancers and other clinical effects such as cataracts and cardiovascular disease occur. Now I'm gonna give a trigger warning here because the following slide is very upsetting. This is a burn victim from uh, August the 6th, 1945 in Hiroshima. A nuclear war would realistically involve many nuclear weapons targeting many cities in a country or country. Michael, Michael, yes? we don't have that slide, I'm afraid. That hasn't come up for us. Uh, okay. Um, can you hear? Uh, Let's see if I can back up one slide. We can't, we're not seeing any How about slides. Now? No, we're not seeing any slides. I'll turn off my video for a moment, will I? Well, um, are you screen sharing? Yeah. Sorry, audience, sorry. Oh. <laughs> are you screen sharing? If not, it's probably best just to carry on. Okay, let's uh, see. Doing it verbally, but um, just recognizing that we're not looking at any images. That's All probably right. the best thing to Hold do. On. Uh, okay. Now you've frozen, Michael. Okay, I'll be with you in a minute. Uh, I need the screen share. I have to go back to the. Uh... You, should, you should see it in a green, little green box at the yeah. bottom of your screen. Okay. Okay. Look, Michael, yeah. just leave um, it and carry on with a verbal presentation. Okay, I will. Maybe turn off your screen because you're breaking up a bit. All right. Okay, see if you can uh, see it now. Go. Yes, amongst other things on your screen. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Okay. This one. Okay, I'll just put this up for one moment. Okay. Now I need to. Okay. 
That's the horrific photo of a burn victim from uh, Hiroshima. A, a nuclear war would realistically involve many nuclear weapons targeting many cities. Um, but even if just one uh, average size nuclear weapon, 100 kilotons, were to be detonated over London, an air burst today, the immediate health impact would be catastrophic. An estimated 250,000 people would die immediately, and another estimated 100, 893,000 could be injured. That's about one in eight people in London's 2020 population. A larger 1,000 kiloton bomb has been estimated to kill between 600,000 to 1 million people and injure between 1.2 million to 2.5 million people. To a distance of a little over one kilometer from the detonation point, the explosion would likely generate a fatal dose of ionizing radiation. A fireball would extend out 380 meters in every direction from the detonation point. For example, if the bomb were dropped over the Palace of Westminster, a nuclear fireball would engulf St. Thomas's Hospital. How long, how could London respond to a health crisis of this proportion? In the case that one out of eight of the population dies or is injured, it means every doctor alive and left alive in London would be responsible for treating 39 people, many with severe injuries simultaneously. Within 4.4 kilometers, people would suffer third degree burns all on all exposed skin. At least 15 hospitals would lie within this zone. Within 3.3 kilometers in every direction from the center, it would there would be a blast, um, da blast damage with residential buildings collapsing, local fires starting from the destruction. Everyone in this zone would be injured and many would die. S several more hospitals are within this range of the blast, such as Guy's Hospital and St. Thomas's Hospital. Remember, in London, there are only two specialist burn beds and 16 in all of England. It would not be possible to use all of these beds due to the uh, disruption and destruction. The UK may prepare to use nuclear weapons, but it, its healthcare infrastructure is not and cannot be prepared for the humanitarian catastrophe that would result from the use of just one nuclear weapon. In 1983, the Royal College of Nursing concluded with a chilling statement that echoed the British Medical Association's findings of that year. All the adjectives of doom in the English language would hardly do justice to the effects of a nuclear strike involving one major weapon. On the 17th of September, 2017, the International uh, Committee for the Red Cross president stated, we do not ever want to experience the utter devastation and suffering that would result from a nuclear weapons attack. The use of more powerful nuclear weapons that exist today would have even more devastating impact than Hiroshima. It's an alarming but true reality. If a nuclear conflict happened today, there is no humanitarian assistance capacity that could adequately respond. Um, your time's up pretty much, Michael. I don't know. And if you I'm on my last slide. Okay, thank you. All this information is horrific enough. Unfortunately, most scenarios conclude that the use of one weapon would lead to escalation and more weapons being used. Stuart Parkinson is going to, uh, now from Scientists for Global Responsibility, is going to address those scenarios now. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed, Michael. And when you were speaking, I think more than anything else, it reminded me of in the 1980s seeing that terrible film threads, you know, sort of dramatized, I know, but nevertheless, it absolutely conveyed the horror that we could expect, not only dying, but as you say, you know, the, the, the dead, the living envied the dead, you know, the terrible horrors of life after the bomb has gone off. Um, well, so thank you very much for that presentation. And then now turning to our third speaker, Dr. Stuart Parkinson from Scientists for Global Responsibility. Stuart, welcome and over to you. Very much, Kate, and thanks to all at CND for organizing this really important webinar. 
I have some slides as well. Hopefully they will work a bit better than some of the others so far. Um, can you all see that okay? Yeah, fine, thank you. Great, okay. Well, let me know if it if, um, they stop working. Okay, um, I'm Stuart Parkinson. I'm Director of Scientists for Global Responsibility in the UK. Um, we're an organisation of about 700 scientists and engineers, and we evolved out of um, an organisation called Scientists Against Nuclear Arms during the Cold War. Um, so I'm going to talk about nuclear winter. Um, you've heard some pretty frightening things so far. Unfortunately, it gets worse. And I will make these slides available on our website afterwards if you want to look into these issues more in detail. So um, people are rightly concerned at the moment about the threat from global climate change. There are due to carbon emissions. Um, the potential impacts of, of climate change due to carbon emissions are frightening and um, very much in our, our minds um, with COP26. Um, what people don't know very much about um, is climate change due to nuclear war and the ways in which um, nuclear war can cause even more extreme climate change than that due to carbon emissions. Um, the academic research that's been carried out using many of the same research tools and, and mathematical models as have been used to understand climate change from carbon emissions show that even a regional nuclear war that's something like um, India versus Pakistan would have devastating global impacts. And the key differences between um, climate change due to um, carbon emissions and climate change due to nuclear war, uh, the first one is direction. Um, nuclear war would cause a global cooling rather than a global warming, um, or maybe better global freezing. Um, speed, nuclear war would cause much more rapid changes. So instead of um, changes over decades, you're talking changes over one or two years. And then magnitude, um, nuclear war can cause even larger changes. So I'm going to show you a little animation here just um, to explain the basic steps of a nuclear winter. So um, First, you get the nuclear explosions. Um, as Rebecca talked about at the beginning, they can lead to firestorms, intense fires that spread. Um, they pull in air and they, they, they generate hurricane force winds, which then, um, oops, which then lead to plumes of smoke and they, they get injected into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere, so above the clouds, um, so they don't get rained out and they start to spread out in the stratosphere. This reflects sunlight and so blocks out the sun and, um, and temperatures quickly drop and plants die and then humans and animals starve. So that's the basic um, science. Um, there have been a number of academic studies. There are a bunch of studies in the 1980s that, that highlighted this cause. Um, since about 2007, they've been updated. Um, I've listed a, a few of the key ones here. There are others um, as well. Um, and they've looked at a number of scenarios published in academic journals using many of the same research tools, as I say, of global um, climate change and carbon emission driven climate change. So th there's a high degree of confidence that these are, are reasonable and realistic. So there are three main scenarios studied. Um, one is a regional study, as I, as I mentioned, the potential for a, a conflict between India and Pakistan using about 100 Hiroshima-sized nuclear warheads. And remember, those are, are much smaller than the ones deployed by um, US, UK, and Russia, for example. Um, we also, in, in Scientists for Global Responsibility, we, we um, expanded that study and looked at um, the warheads carried by one UK Trident submarine, and we reckoned about 40 of the warheads that are carried on a Trident submarine could, could generate a similar impact as the 100 Hiroshima-sized warheads. So, um, and that's less than 1% of the global number of warheads. So it's a tiny fraction, and there are still major impacts, as, as I'll 
um, talk about. And then there are two other scenarios, a global low scenario and a global high scenario. The global low scenario is um, all current active um, US, nuclear, uh, US and Russian um, warheads and missiles. Um, the global high scenario was done at a time when there are more nuclear weapons in the world, so it's a higher end, but um, given that the number of deployed warheads is increasing again, that might, that situation might be a threat in the future. So the key impacts of a regional war scenario, so this is the smaller option, um, so you get large areas of severe fire, fire zones, and they would inject somewhere in the region of 5 million tonnes of soot into the stratosphere. So you get sudden major drop in surface temperature lasting over seven years. Um, it would take a year or two years to, to get to the, the coldest point of that, and then it would bounce back slowly. So it would be colder, the global temperature would be cold, colder than at least a thousand years. You get severe frosts and droughts and leading to much shorter growing seasons and reduction in crop yields for years. You get a loss of ozone in the ozone layer that protects us from ultraviolet radiation from the sun, major impacts on, on ecosystems. And um, one study by um, the international um, physicians um, for the prevention of nuclear war, um, they estimated that about 2 billion people would be threatened with famine, um, which is about one in, one in four of the global population. Um, so it, it, the scale is, is just, it's hard to imagine. It's absolutely huge. And that's in addition to um, the number of direct deaths from the nuclear explosions, which in this scenario would be somewhere between 10 and 21 million. So the, the, these figures are just mind boggling. And this is a small nuclear war, a, a regional nuclear war. So um, this is a graph of different, the three different scenarios that I've talked about. So this is a temperature graph. Um, this is the blue line is the increase in global temperatures over the last hundred years or so due to carbon emissions. Um, the scale at the side is um, the temperature change um, relative to, to a baseline um, in, in the 1950s approximately. So you see that there's about a one degree temperature rise over that period due to the um, carbon emissions. And you can see that if there were a nuclear war, um, this paper was published in 2007, so it talks about um, scenarios from then. Um, you can see an immediate dip for each of the three scenarios. So the red one is the regional scenario, so that's over one degree um, within two years and then slowly recovering. Um, the global low scenario, the green one, that is an immediate fall of over three degrees and then recovering and the global high scenario is immediate fall of, of seven degrees. So um, it, it's far in excess of anything that humans have experienced um, and, and um, yeah, a frightening consequences. And um, to give you another comparison, the global low scenario, the green scenario, that's equivalent to going moving into an ice age in two years. Um, it's that catastrophic. Um, this is um, a graph sort of um, expanding on, on um, the um, modeling scenarios. So th this looks at the whole globe and, and estimates the temperature losses, um, temperature falls in summer um, due to a global high scenario. So um, you can see massive temperature reductions, uh, minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, minus 35 degrees in, in some in intercontinental areas. Um, and, and those are ma major crop growing areas as well. So the, the effects would be catastrophic. This, this is the highest scenario, the global low scenario, which is the current level of, um, of nuclear weapons in, in the world today. Um, they would be about half of that. So, but you're still talking about 10 to 20 degrees um, temperature reductions um, in, in many parts of the world in summer. And, and as I'm sure you can imagine that, that's um, catastrophic for um, crop growing. So we need to spread the word about this stuff. Um, nuclear weapons labs, um, the Los Alamos um, nuclear weapons labs in the US have published a, a modeling study looking at nuclear winter. Um, they argued it wouldn't be as bad, um, but they've been criticized for, for using um, questionable assumptions. And, and I think we can, 
conclude that their research is, is rather more flawed. Um, and that kind of muddies the water around this issue. But it's really important that we do we do spread the word about this issue. And, and one of the things we've noticed in SGR trying to talk to, um, trying to get science journalists and defence journalists to talk about this issue is, is they, they can be reluctant and say, oh, well, it's uncertain and, and maybe the research isn't, isn't robust enough. It is, it is, um, the, and they should at least be discussing the issue, um, even if they think it's not quite as bad because it's still really, really bad. Um, and, and that gives an excuse to governments and militaries to avoid talking about this issue. And of course, so public and even parliamentary parliamentarians don't have much knowledge about this issue. And it needs to be known, it needs to be as well known as, as climate change due to carbon emissions, because the threats are phenomenal. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much indeed, Stuart. Fantastic. Um, so. I've got some questions coming in at the moment. I'm going to be um, reading them out to our panelists shortly. Um, but just to let everyone know that we've got some new materials coming out from CND in the next few days, briefings and information um, about these specific issues, what a nuclear war would look like, some specific information around radiation impact and so on. Um, in the meantime, before those come out, we have some uh, campaigning materials um, available already. You may have seen um, the No Nuclear War placards if you were on a demonstration at the weekend. Um, but I think also we have um, smaller versions of the posters, poster size ones. You can either print them off at home or you can order them um, online from the CND website. So if you want to use those either at a local store or if you want to uh, use them on social media as a photo, um, then, then please do. So I think that um, Sarah is going to be uh, putting that link there in, in, the, um, in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to throw some questions out um, and then I'm going to come back to the speakers to respond to any elements of those. I mean, some are more up some people's street than others, so um, please do just uh, choose the bits you want to hear, you want to respond to. So first of all, um, in the 1980s, the government produced Protect and Survive, um, to paint our windows white and hide under the kitchen table. Well, I remember that as well, actually. <laughs> I expect some others do on here. Um, and CND published Protest and Survive, demonstrating that we had to stop the bomb, not imagine we could survive it. The question is, is this still the best advice today? Okay, so that's the first one. Um, then... Uh, secondly, a more scientific one, how long would it take the world to recover? Okay, um, and then third, actually this is a topical one because we have had a little news item on our website about iodine tablets. Are iodine tablets any help? They are issued near some nuclear facilities. Um, Someone's asking about nuclear bunkers. I know they were a big thing in the 80s as well. Who is listed to use a nuclear bunker? And will they still be used, I guess? Um, what, if anything, would survive a nuclear apocalypse? Um, uh, someone's making a suggestion about a video call to Parliament, so that comes in the campaigning side. Um, and then the final one I'm going to put up for now, we'll see if we've got time to come back to any more. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists suggests that Russia might target military assets to de-escalate de a war it is losing. Doesn't this point to the need to scale back conventional weapons alongside abolishing nuclear weapons? Um, interesting point there. OK, so... Um, colleagues on the panel, pick and choose what you would like to... Uh, respond to, and of course, um, from the CND point of view, any campaigning uh, suggestions and proposals would also be very good as well. So, um, who would like to go first? Okay, well, I shall pick Rebecca then. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, oh, the great questions. <clears throat> and uh, yes, so I'm 
protect and survive and protest and survive. Well, as a young woman, uh, as a student uh, who just come back from Japan and was in London, I went down to Greenham Common to try to directly obstruct and, and, and block and protest against that new generation of the cruise missiles that were coming in in the 80s. And I think it was so important to do that. And, you know, and I applaud all of those, the, 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 the Russians that are out in the street trying to protest against the war. I also applaud, and I think we need to make this connection with the climate um, protesters. These are so intimately connected in uh, and see that for everything that we want in terms of survival for the future, we need to keep on, we need to keep the right to protest and we need to keep being out there telling the truth, whether it's, it's, it's liked or not. And I'm aware that in the, the chat, some people didn't like that I was talking about Putin's war or talking about deterrence. But the fact of the matter is we have these, you know, nearly 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world because nine nuclear armed leaders, all nine of which happen to be men at this at particular time, but hasn't always been the case, but nine nuclear armed leaders who um, believe that having nuclear weapons uh, is for deterrence, or at least that's the argument they use to con the people into allowing them to carry on spending billions and billions at a time of austerity, a time when people are starving, a time when the NHS is being, being denied the resources it needs uh, throughout COVID and, and, and now when it's trying to recover. The billions going into to, to Trident here, you know, they're stealing security from us and from every single country that has nuclear weapons and militarism as a whole. That was one of the questions. Yes, absolutely. There are reasons why quite a lot of us who who campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, who worked so hard to get the UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons also are working to oppose um, any kind of explosive weapons used in, in the cities. The Ainu who were out, you know, getting the ban on landmines, the ban on cluster munitions. We know that those are also now being used in this war. Uh, and, um, you know, we have to put all of those things together. We need to oppose militarism. Militarism is the greatest contributor also to climate destruction. And Stuart and his colleagues have done a, a terrific amount on that. Um, and uh, the question about how long would it take the world to recover? It's like, it really means how long, how many nuclear weapons get used? Because if even 1% of the 12,000, 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world now were used, I think it's really questionable how how much would recover. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it was maybe Daniel Ellsberg or someone like that, who, who, who said something about that the fourth world war would be fought with, with sticks and stones. Because, so let's understand that even this very limited a possibility of a nuclear war, even one nuclear weapon will destroy a city and change everything. So we have to take the horrors that we're already seeing and change everything now. We've got to stop this war. We've got to get a ceasefire. We've got to, you know, support, um, you know, all the, 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 the people that are actually trying to hold on to, to, to their, their homes and their, and their cities. And we have to let all the refugees in. We, we absolutely, because these are the people who, who need help now and the people who will help to rebuild afterwards. Uh, and if you're thinking about bunkers, forget it. They were nonsense in, 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 in um, the 1980s. I actually even got once trained, I dressed up all, 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 all nice and went with a friend who dressed up nice for a training on doing that emergency service in Reading uh, um, and was taught about leaving the children outside in the, in the um, car park of the underground bun bunker because they couldn't actually be accommodated inside the bunker. I mean, it, it, it was this and, you know, all of the bunkers leak. So forget about bunkers, we have to stop 
any possibility. We have to stop nuclear weapons being used. And that means not just banning them, but eliminating them. And that means getting the UK to sign up to them. And we, you know, if we are going to use this horror for anything, it has to be as a teaching of why nuclear weapons are never for deterrence. They fail at deterrence. Deterrence has already failed when somebody like you know, Blair invades Iraq or, or with Bush or Putin invades uh, Ukraine. And then it's just a question of, do you have a miscalculation, a mistake, an intent from one of these narcissistic, dangerous people who my fear is would use nuclear weapons not to save a country, but just to prevent humiliation for themselves. That's what we are up against. Thanks very much indeed, Rebecca. Um, I'm urging uh, the audience <laughs> to look in the chat. There's some very interesting stuff coming up there. This is um, Rebecca in response to the uh, World War Four sticks and stones thing. Um, Einstein was asked what World War Three would be like. He implied he didn't know, but what he did know, World War Four would be fought with sticks and stones. I mean, how could I have misquoted <laughs> Einstein? <laughs> so um, that's um, that's very profound, yeah, actually. Um, and then uh, someone else is asking about. Um, I don't know whether you'll be able to incorporate this, Stuart, in your comments. How these issues around the environment and agriculture and so on could be raised at the next. Uh, COP meeting. Um, so now, uh, Michael, I'm going to turn to you if you'd like to respond to some of those elements. So there is a question about uh, uh, potassium iodide. Does that help uh, block radiation sickness? Uh, it, it only blocks radiation that goes to the thyroid. It doesn't block it affecting other parts of the body. So th there's not really any way to uh, be saved by taking those tablets. And it would only give a false sense of security. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, back in the 80s, I, I went to Greenham. But before I went to Greenham, I took the Trans-Siberian Express uh, from Japan uh, to London to get to London. And I stayed with a Habaku Shah, uh, a, a survivor from Hiroshima, who invited me to stay at their house. And uh, turned out he lived in a Buddhist temple and he was the head of the Hiroshima Jazz Appreciation Society. And from looking at him, he only had a burn on his ear, but of his elementary school where he was when the bomb went off, I think he, my memory is he said there was 150 people in the school and only three survived. So uh, he had dedicated his life to trying to raise awareness. Um, I think, what other questions would people, I, I think that in the eighties, there was a mass movement. Uh, people at Greenham led the way, people in Germany uh, demonstrated against the cruise missiles. And I was on some of those demonstrations. Uh, the message of people like uh, the speakers here today need to reach young people, uh, especially, especially activists, but even non-activists, to show the reality uh, so that it doesn't seem like it's something from history, that it's, it's real right now. Uh, how do we do that? Well, we need, we need not just to influence politicians, but we need to get the message out to uh, young people and suggest things they can do. There's no reason there can't be a mass movement again against nuclear weapons, especially linking with climate change activists. Okay, thanks very much, Michael. And I think the point about linking up with um, climate change activists is incredibly important. And of course, um, over the past couple of years uh, with Extinction Rebellion and then XR Peace being founded, that's certainly something in the anti-nuclear movement that many of us have been attempting to do. And I think 
going forward, uh, particularly um, hopefully surviving this war, you know, that is something that we're really going to be able to address on a bigger scale. And of course, I mentioned the doomsday clock at the beginning. Um, they had those that ha those hands set at that uh, 100 seconds to midnight because of the twin existential threats of nuclear weapons and the climate catastrophe. You know, so in the thinking of experts as well, it's very, very much linked together. Um, so before we turn to Stuart for our uh, final contribution, just reminding you all to look at the chat again. There was a bit of a discussion there going on about um, whether the Green and women had a, 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 a modest victory or a big victory. And um, John Cox, I'll just name check John because he's a vice president of CND. Uh, he said Green and women won a huge victory. And I think <laughs> I think I'm going to agree with that. Uh, so um, okay. So now, Stuart, over to you for your uh, final remarks. If you could answer those questions, as many as you would like. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll have a go. Um, I mean, I guess there were some around how long to recover from a nuclear war. I mean, it, it's. A, a, even a regional nuclear war would bring down civilization as we know it. And that would undo not just thousands of years of, um, of social development, um, technological development, but the environmental impacts and the recovery um, of and the loss of species when we're already causing a mass extinction event just by overconsumption. Um, it's you know we're talking at, at best centuries, at worst um, you know thousand well several thousand years. Um, it, it, you know, it, it's it's almost not worth having a conversation because it, it's so awful that you, we must prevent it. And I, I think that kind of leads into the issue that just if one country breaks the nuclear taboo, if one country uses its nuclear weapons um, in, in a world where there are uh, around um, 12,000, 13,000 nuclear weapons still are, are around, um, the, the way the the speed at which that could escalate and um one of the scary things i i read recently was about the um latest um ministry of defense's research program on artificial intelligence you know they have a new defense center they call it a defense center i'm not entirely sure that name is accurate um on artificial intelligence and um one of the things that they were saying was oh it's wonderful how we managed to use artificial intelligence to help us speed up decision making um, within military exercises um, that they've been doing. And, and that's a, a frightening thing, that um, the speed at which decisions could be made over nuclear weapons um, uh, can be speeded up. And, and that takes you into the issue of cyber weapons and the way in which hacking could occur, the way in which misinformation could be passed around. We've seen such a problem with fake um, news over the past few years um, and the way in which that could lead us to lead decision makers to stumbling into nuclear war by accident um, and that's the biggest threat in my opinion someone miscalculates someone has a bad day someone had some sort of technical fault some sort of cyber attack um, means computers go down in a critical part of the system it, it's that's the sort of message we need to get across to people is that once you cross that threshold, it's really, really hard um, to stop things escalating. Can I just jump in, Kate, because I've forgotten to say, and Ailsa has reminded me that we, we need also to do shout outs for what is actually happening now. Aldermaston Women's Peace Camp, which was started in 1985 at Greenham and has been going a weekend every month <laughs> Since then, apart from a, a, a bit with COVID, they are going to be down at, at Aldermaston this coming weekend. All women uh, and girls are, are welcome, men to can, can come and visit, but uh, not to stay overnight. And uh, they're going to be there from Friday evening till Sunday. And then all of the activities going on in Scotland around Faz Lane, around Coolport, where the nuclear weapons are stored, Faz Lane, obviously, where the nuclear submarines are home ported and uh and about the nuclear warhead convoys where we face you know nuclear disasters 
just by the possibility of accidents on the road when warheads are being carried. So we need to come at it from all of these angles. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that that what um, is happening at Audemaston was was actually highlighted. Thank you for giving me that moment to jump in. Oh, no, that's fantastic, Rebecca. <laughs> Very keen to have um, people have access to all the information about these developments and uh, actions that are taking place. And um, just to say a big thank you to all the C and D groups who came out in force last Sunday as part of the global day of action against the war in Ukraine, the many creative different ways of people engaging some big, some just a few, handful of people in a tiny village. You know, we've heard about uh, so many uh, experiences that people have, have had. Um, so before we close, I'm just going to, in case people, anyone hasn't heard the great news of TPNW has been mentioned, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, the Welsh Senate, that's the Welsh Parliament, um, has voted uh, calling on all states to support the TPNW. So that's fan fantastic. You know, the Westminster Parliament, they won't touch it with a barge pole, but um, the Welsh Parliament, uh, well done, Wales, and uh, well done, CND Cymru, for all the work that you did to uh, make that happen. So thanks very much, um, everyone, for joining us today. I know that we're all painfully and dreadfully aware of the catastrophe that's taking place. Um, oh, just I'm just going to quickly respond to some what there was one question um, as well. Surely NATO needs to be disarmed too. Absolutely everybody needs to be disarmed. All nuclear weapons need to be abolished. You know, they're illegal. Um, you know, words fail me how terrible nuclear weapons are and how awful um, this current situation is and how even worse it will be if people go down the nuclear road. So let's do everything we can together, united, to ensure the abolition of nuclear weapons and to ensure that this war comes to a speedy end. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Uh, thanks to Sarah for uh, hosting on the tech front and uh, hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.